Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, important meeting, which we normally conduct every Sunday at 6 p.m. Sri Lankan time. Basically, uh, we are a group of people who are basically Sri Lankans for Sri Lankans. So we're trying to share our knowledge with everybody. We are actually a concept and not really an identity. So, but we are registered as an educational charity in Sri Lanka. The official name is Leeds Forum. So individuals, groups, parties who can follow Leeds principle, which is very simple. We learn from each other, we educate each other, and we assess individually or group based on good information and facts and decide. So if most of us in Sri Lanka is doing that, Sri Lanka will be wonderful. So initial mission that we have is for three years. It is going very well. It will go for 10 years and constitutionally we will automatically dissolve that 10 years. One important thing is to allow people to share their knowledge. We do not disclose identity officially and it is our policy. So if somebody asks who is there in Leeds, nobody will know. However, if you are a member and then you want to say yourself saying we are supporting Leeds, you can do that. All the information that we collect is completely secured by just one person. There's only one access, one person who can access the data. So today's speaker is uh, Rohan Petiagoda. I'll give a short introduction shortly. And he's going to talk about how can Sri Lanka recover? So in our own, based on our old discussions, and we have come out with three important aspects like reduce wastage and corruption is one main thing. Increase the productivity by giving renewable energy and education at all levels and promoting research and innovation to solve Sri Lankan problems. And that's one of the important things that we have highlighted. So we're doing a few things along this line and there's a petition that we've launched two weeks ago, which is going well, and there's a QR code here. Nine items of this is to promote liberal democracy and promote peace and unity. One item is there to abolish presidency. I'm glad to say out of the people who voted for this, 99% or 100% of the people identify seven items of this as 100% agreeable. And all the others agree up to about 95% agreeable for abolish presidency. So we are doing well with that at the moment. We'll report the full data later. All the data that we collect in relation to the petition is completely secure and, and he, nobody has access except one person. So we're proposing food banks given the situation currently in Sri Lanka. And we uh, got some people now trying to work on it. Basically, we will have a food bank every Sunday it's a three-year project. Basically use morning for collection of various donated items and PM for distribution. Recipients will be registered in an online database to basically reduce corruption as much. And the Sunday coordinator will be reimbursed at least the traveling costs, et cetera. And local temples, churches, mosques, and other centers like schools may be used in the, in the town. So it's a, it's a project in your town or village for the town or the village. So if you want to be involved, just write to me. My name is Julia, but um, just uh, uh, say admin Sri Lanka leads come. So we also want to promote entrepreneur projects. I'm glad to report that there is one project on the way to uh, find a sustainable mechanism to support locally made stoves in the long term as a dollar saving measure cheap and affordable for host homes. And that's a good thing. We're also looking for anyone who can, who can produce small videos or talks for children to understand about humanity, diversity, tolerance, safety, et cetera, so that we promote a civilized education in a way rather than just academic interests aspects. So today's speaker, you all know by name, We'll talk about how can Sri Lanka recover. And he's Rohan Petiagoda. <clears throat> and I'm not going to make an introduction except to say this. 
He was conferred the Linnean Medal for Zoology very recently, and it's almost like the Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize for Naturist. So I'm going to stop uh, there. At the end of the talk, there'll be time for discussion in English, singular or Tamil. And they, I've asked for any questions and a few questions people have submitted and then I have sent it to Rohan and he will answer only the relevant ones to this topic. And thereafter, there is a chance for you to raise your hand and then ask your question. And please introduce at inception something about you, uh, at least to say, you know, what kind of profession you are working on and also the country or the town. So people have some idea who is participating. You don't need to say your name if you don't want to. So I will stop here and invite uh, Rohan to start this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shula. There's going to be a stage wait for a minute till I get my PowerPoint uh, visible to you. So just uh, bear with me. Orthodox uh, high risk strategies. I can see that. Yeah, great. All right. I'm just going to swap this. I'm going to swap the display so that you get a full screen. Give me a second. Yeah, that's good enough. Fantastic. You got a full screen. Brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm <clears throat> just going to quickly run through a few slides explaining uh, the predicament in which we find ourselves so that we can try and quantify the areas in which we need to look at how we come out of this. Now, first off, I uh, am originally an, an engineer, a biomedical engineer from King's College and, and Sussex University. Um, and I worked in government service for seven years in the Ministry of Health and moved into other areas in management in government, in the Water Resources Board and the Tea Board, being advised to the government or environment uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, altogether about six years. Um, and apart from that, I've worked in the private sector, which is how I make a living. Uh, my work in the government has all along been on a voluntary basis in the sense that i haven't got paid for it except for my first seven years when i was uh, early career um so i think of policy as a sri lankan i i work part of my time in australia but this year we've decided to remain in sri lanka because of the problem here and try and do what we can to try and help um, there's no politics in what i'm telling you i'm not criticizing in individuals i'm going to criticize some ideas though uh, so that we can try and get to grips with uh, the, the problem we, we face so in uh, 2019 soon after he was elected president rajapaksa slashed uh, vat and income taxes uh, creating a or increasing the budget deficit by about 600 billion rupees that year. Uh, the intention was that this would create uh, more wealth in the private sector, thereby increasing tax revenue, and that the benefits would trickle down into society. Unfortunately for him, uh, COVID followed just a couple of months later, the economy slowed down, uh, tax revenue de decreased even still further, and the budget deficit couldn't be bridged. In addition to that, the government had to spend more money because there was less uh, revenue in the country, but government expenditure didn't go down, of, of course. And so we, we created a huge budget deficit that had to be bridged uh, by printing. Now, there was a policy alternative there. We could have bridged that budget deficit by selling government assets. But uh, as you know, this is a toxic idea in Sri Lanka. And so the government didn't sell any assets. It could have sold, for example, its shares, its 50% of Sri Lanka Telecom uh, and Mobitel and made itself perhaps 600 billion rupees uh, to, to help, but it didn't because I think it's politically toxic. Uh, last year, the president banned agrochemicals. His reason for doing this was to help with uh, addressing kidney disease. There's a question I received on kidney disease, so we'll come into more detail there. And to preserve the environment. He made this very clear in several speeches that he, he made. Uh, it, he, he didn't uh, associate the ban on agro agrochemicals with the foreign uh, currency deficit, and I, I genuinely don't think he did because the government continued to spend huge money, amounts of money on various things like vehicles uh, after that. So I don't think there was consciousness of uh, foreign currency deficit. Then we come to the central bank governor, highly educated, very clever uh, economist, uh, professor of economics at Columbia University, vice chancellor of Columbia University, a long-term advisor to the government. And the central bank then went on to make several mistakes. 
uh, by printing money to balance the surplus rather than insisting that the government actually sell some assets uh, or, or raise revenue from its own resources rather than just printing. Um, it sought to control at the same time money supply interest, interest rates and foreign exchange rates and no economy on the world can in the world can control all these three factors at the same time. And then, of course, it continued to depreciate the uh, or deplete the foreign exchange reserve, which started from about nine billion dollars in, in 2019 until basically we are down to the last million dollars now. And the reason for doing that was to sustain imports and to, to maintain political popularity, because by restricting imports or raising prices on imported items, uh, governments tend to become unpopular. Now, any one of these five issues that I have raised here would have probably been a really painful thing for uh, the national economy. Taken together, all five of them led to the collapse that we see today. Now, the issue is that these things were known at the time soon after these policy reforms were instituted or implemented economists spoke out about them and said don't do this this is going to be very harmful to the national economy and in the case of the president he's a politician uh, and he has to be treated differently because he his politicians are not supposed to be experts but in the case of the central bank the the bank was run uh, independently by a person who should have known better. Now I'm going to show you a one minute clip. If it doesn't work, I'll just go to the next uh, slide. A one minute clip of Chamoditha interviewing the central bank governor in October of 2020. And you'll get an idea from that as to what uh, the governor's views were, because the idea being that um, the governor took the view that the, the central bank's monetary policy that he was following was out of the mainstream he accepted that it's out of the mainstream and he felt that the people who were criticizing his policy his novel policy which hadn't been tested anywhere else in the world somehow didn't understand reality as he understood it he also thought that the credit rating agencies like Fitch and Modi and Standard and Poor were downgrading Sri Lanka's credit rating because they had some kind of political beef with the government, which is also unfortunate because these ratings agencies are not perfect, but you certainly should pay attention to what they say. So here's Chamudita. If you can't hear him, I'll just go on to the next slide. So Chula, can you please confirm when you see when I start to play this tape, if you can't hear it, just tell me. I can't hear the noise. I think you had to put up the noise on the screen. I can't hear him talking. Excuse me. When you screen share, there right. are two boxes you need to tick so to, for the sound oh, to come good. out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let me let me go back to that. Yeah. And share, reshare at that point, tick the two boxes. That's good. Mervin is um, is IT expert. So whatever Hi, he says. Mervin. Just... Mervin, for the sake of time, because I might mess it up further, uh, okay. would you would the audience please mind reading the in the English translation, which is my words, which I have written as a subscript on the screen. So that might just get us out of the way, please. So uh, what it says it's... is according to the Moody's credit rating agency. Th that's we, right, yes. So I'll, I'll play the been... tape and we... I'll play it again. One second, one second. Uh, we can't hear anything. It, you need to just, just read, read, read the subtitles. Read the subtitles. Okay. okay. Yeah. So here we are. Uh, I find it difficult to imagine how you arrive at a conclusion that the economy is in serious trouble when agencies such as Moody's issue of downgrade of this kind, it comes to be used as a means to disparage the government. I heard it said by representatives of the government at a press conference that Moody's may have a political agenda. That more than a warning relating to the economy, this downgrade has a political basis. Although these are said to be international standards, are they biased? They are somewhat biased. Towards whom are they biased? 
if I take mainstream economists, they are completely opposed to the economic methodology we are following at present. They are very critical of the system we are following. If I take mainstream economists, they are completely opposed to the economic methodology we are following at present. They are very critical of the system we are following. This is to say that your system, they say system is unsuitable for any country, but I say for countries like ours, for developing countries, their system is unsuitable. So the point being that the, that the governor accepted that his was an unorthodox approach to a national economy. We, we were trying to invent a wheel of some kind here. And sadly, it, it, it failed. Now, while all this was going on, that was, mind you, 18 months ago, while all this was going on, there were economists like Dashal de Mel and Dhananath Fernando speaking out publicly. And these are responsible, non-political people speaking out publicly saying, please don't do this. We, we are, we're heading for a crisis. But nobody paid attention. So instead, the central bank went on printing money. As you can see, uh, uh, we printed 2.3 trillion by March of 2022. And the result is now that we have this uh, huge inflation going on. At the moment, it's probably about 60% for food items. And uh, it hasn't properly been quantified because the time has been too short since this spiral began. Now, if we look at government spending as, as a whole, the Sri Lankan government spends about 330 billion rupees a month, most of that on salaries. And as you'll see from this quarterly spending profile, uh, this, this cannot really be reduced. Um, the loan repayments you see here are servicing of local debt, not, not uh, foreign debt. Um, but when we when we add this all together, it means that we have to find 330 billion rupees a month. Now, recently, taxes went back close to the 2019 levels in, in some respects, but still the government will only earn about 300 billion rupees extra uh, from those taxes. The economy in the meantime is contracting, so tax revenue will go down still further. As a result of this, the government will be forced to sprint print pretty much 300 billion rupees every month from now on. Uh, this is not going to help uh, inflation going, going forward. By the middle of this year, I suspect that workers will be asking for substantial salary increments to keep up with inflation. Many workers cannot afford to travel to work. They can't pay for the transport. They can't buy lunch. Um, tea plantation workers will definitely want more because the tea plantations being dollar earners are, are profitable. So we are going to see labor unrest, I suspect, by August, September this year, looking at substantially higher wages, which in turn will also have to be printed. So I think the point that we need to recognize as Sri Lankans is that something very fundamentally different happened on the 12th of April. I, I see that as a, as a day we should never forget in Sri Lankan history from now on because that is the day we declared that we are bankrupt. Now, bankruptcy for a country is a fundamental uh, issue. It's, it's something from which no country recovers easily or quickly. I think the planning for Sri Lanka should now be for the next 20 years. I think it will be perhaps a decade or two before even in the best case, we can get back to the economy of 2019. It's going to be a very slow battle from, from this point because the, the behavior of the economy, the behavior of society is now completely unpredictable, as, as we saw even recently. So we're headed for a long period of political and social instability. Now, when this happens, especially in a high inflation environment, it causes a lot of distress to society. It, it increases inequality. And what I mean by in, increasing in, inequality is that the traditional three tier upper middle and working class uh, structure of society tends to shrink into a two tier, the fat cats on top and poor people increasingly being driven into poverty at the bottom. Now, the problem we face here is that the victims tend to be the children of the poor. I'm going to spend a little time explaining why this is a concern to me, and I'm sure you'd have uh, uh, good reasons to tell me why I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to dwell on this for a, for a minute or, or two. We have 3 million children in Sri Lanka who are under the age of 12. 
Um, and we have a massive shortage of food. As you know, Sri Lanka has been self-sufficient in rice for at least the last 15 years, give or take. We've been a net, net exporter of rice, except very rarely. But now, in the past year, we have become an importer of rice, a major importer of rice. Now, this graph takes us all the way up to 2021, showing rice production in Sri Lanka. You can see a massive dip in 2016. There were two reasons for this dip. One was that the then Yahapalana government messed up fertilizer imports at the end of 2015. They were uh, having an argument about whether to renew the subsidy or not. Uh, having won the general election, they thought they could take a tough measure of removing the subsidy. That turned out to be politically unacceptable. It was it was getting very ugly for them. Um, and and so they, they delayed fertilizer imports. At the same time, it was a particularly dry year. So those two problems for the economy led to an unprecedented fall in rice production. So we get an idea of what happens to rice when there's economic or fertilizer or climate issues. Now, we don't know how much our production fell in the last Maha season because the government is still not releasing the figures. The figures were ready by February of this year, but the they are not being released to the public. My friends in the agriculture department tell me that the crop fell by about 55%. That's uh, quite substantial. So what's happened with rice? This is the food of everyone, including the poor. The price has doubled. We have imported a million metric tons, more than a million metric tons so far in, in the past 12 months. Um, an estimated 100,000 hectares of rice went uncultivated in the last mass season, and much of that remains uncultivated for the current Yala season. And it lost our farmers about 100 billion rupees. Now, this is not just a financial problem, because Sri Lanka already was having problems with nutrition even before these problems began. You can see that even by Asian standards, our uh, per capita consumption of nutrition or calories uh, lags behind the, the rest of Asia. When it comes to proteins, we are particularly bad. And this has impacts, of course, for children. And my concern, as I told you already, is, is children. I worry about the cognitive skills of children going forward. Now, the reason I'm focusing on the children is, in my estimate, I have no reasons for giving you this number except by looking at other countries who have been in similar predicaments uh, like Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, Argentina, and so on. These insolvency crises are not escapable in, in the short term. It's a 10, 20, 30 year term that we're looking at. So my argument is that if it's going to be a 20 year term or even a 10 year term, it's today's zero to 12 generation that will inherit Sri Lanka, be the workers and leaders of Sri Lanka when the time comes for our economy to recover, assuming that we can hold things together until then. And if we further uh, handicap that generation by retarding their neurocognitive development going into that period, we are doing us, ourselves and our country a huge disfavor. So I I would like the primary emphasis of government to be on nutrition. Now I've been I've been yelling about this for a bit, and I'm glad that the government's been listening. We have the World Food Program, UNICEF, and the World Bank uh, combining, hopefully very soon, to start a package of nutri uh, nutrition support for the poor. But I'm I, I don't think we should stop there. We should we should keep looking at how we can manage in the long term, because even if we get support for a couple of years, we have to think four, 10, 20 years down the road as to, as to how we can keep Sri Lanka's poor nourished. Now, we don't have many uh, studies of IQ, uh, cognitive development in, in Sri Lanka. The few that there are uh, suggest that we lag the UK, for example, by about 10, 12 points. No, that's, that's bad. That's bad because especially the people we're going to look to, uh, to the restoration of Sri Lanka, the economy, and so on, are going to be the intellectual group, the science, technology, engineering, and medicine group, who usually come out with an IQ of about 120. You don't get into medical school unless you've got about 130 these days. And so if you're already lagging by 12 points below the, the median, um, we're, we're in some trouble. So we need to push this uh, normal distribution 
a lot further to the right. But even without that, while we are still disadvantaged as far as our cognitive skills are concerned, we lag many even poorer countries in per capita GDP terms. We lag poorer countries in Asia in terms of our educational spending. We are very proud of free education, but actually the educational spend and our, our education and outcomes are, are really bad. If you look at the percentages of children who pass their O-levels to get into A-levels and then pass their A-levels to get into university, you're getting into trivial territory. It's, it's really very serious. And it's not just cognitive development, even as far as height is concerned, stature of children uh, matters. I think uh, boys now are, are what uh, six centimeters taller than their grandparents, which is fantastic. Girls are eight percent, eight centimeters taller than their grandmothers. Uh, so this development also is fantastic, and we don't want to turn the clock back on that. So the stature of children is important. But amongst the poorest children, the poorest one third of children, we have this terrible set of statistics which really are intractable and this was already the case before the present crisis began so under fives are increasingly anemic they're stunted um, underweight and and the problem ex extends also to lactating and pregnant mothers so nutrition to the poor who are already who are in this situation already by five years ago uh, is, is going to be that much more important and urgent going forward. Because malnourished children are at high risk of low uh, intelligence. So what can we do in terms of indigenous terms that the, the, chi the, the cheapest proteins available at the level of the village is freshwater fish and eggs. I think we should have a special program to get these uh, going. Sri Lanka's got, after all, something close to 10,000 uh, inland tanks. Uh, but only 7.6% of that huge freshwater resource is at the present used for aquaculture. Uh, that could be enhanced substantially, as you'll see here. The uh, freshwater fisheries um, bring in today about 70,000, 65,000 uh, tons of freshwater fish. That could easily be increased several fold because we are only seeding uh, less than 8% of our freshwater resource. So if you just do a calculation on the back of an envelope, you can see that if we increase that 7.6% to 40%, we can generate uh, pretty much uh, a million uh, tons of fish per week to, to feed, especially the poor uh, who live in the dry zone, who tend to be the, the poorest areas. So if you look at malnourishment on a district basis in Sri Lanka, for example, it turns out that Kilinochi, Muletivu and Monoragala are the, are the worst in, in those areas. Uh, more than 25% of uh, under fives are nourished. So it's, it's quite serious. Now let's leave it, that there. I'm going to park that there and look quickly at energy and the problem we face going forward with energy and the environment. So this is the energy profile of the country. And as you can see, we already, before this crisis began, we were depending on biomass, on firewood for energy, uh, for 37% of our energy. So this is the rural poor who are not the people standing in line for gas. They, they are cooking already on firewood stoves. Now, because gas has uh, become almost impossible to get, people are increasingly turning to firewood. Shula, I think you mentioned uh, the introduction of stoves. Fantastic idea. I put an order in for a firewood stove myself. Fortunately, I have a fairly large garden, so I generate my own firewood, but many people don't and the rates of deforestation, especially in the highlands where, where the gas is difficult to get on uh, tea estates, for example, the amount of uh, attrition this is going to have on our forest reserves is going to be something astonishing. So the dwindling forests around Norelia, which is what you can see here, uh, will, will have even more uh, troubles going forward. I often say that poverty is the greatest enemy of the environment, and as poverty increases, we will see more and more environmental problems. But the thing is, there's good news there as well. The Forest Department and the Wildlife Department together manage about 80,000 hectares of plantation forests. These are not wild forests, so eucalyptus, mahogany, teak, and so on. Uh, much of this is over mature for the reason that 
environmental pressure has prevented the forest department and the timber corporation from harvesting these forests for the past 20, 20 or 30 years. Um, but maybe the time has come to, to harvest a substantial amount of it uh, in terms of import substitution for timber and then the opportunity that arises by replanting some, some of this land at least for um, for en energy substitution for using uh, instead of gas. Unfortunately, we don't have enough forest to do this. Uh, to replace, again, this time on the front of the envelope, I've done a little calculation which suggests that to replace the gas we import to Sri Lanka today with firewood, we would need about 130,000 hectares of, of forest, we, we, uh, of forestry land, not forest. So uh, please don't confuse forest and forestry uh, land. Forestry land is the land on which we are cultivating forest for the purpose of harvesting. So that's about 80,000 hectares. So I'm, I'm suggesting that we use at least half that land to try and uh, get enough uh, firewood to drive maybe uh, or replace 40% of our LPG imports. Uh, we, could, we could aim for higher. Now, both the freshwater fisheries idea that I mentioned here and the forestry idea are enormous in their scope. But I think they're realistic because they're not reinventing the wheel. We have excellent uh, forestry graduates in Sri Lanka who've done a superb job over the past 40, 50 years. The same goes for aquaculture. At least four universities teach aquaculture. We have a huge amount of intellectual capital in the country to drive this expansion. And I think we also have a wonderful army who uh, in peacetime can help us uh, achieve goals of this kind. So I'm looking at uh, the possibility that we can change our energy structure even a little slightly by adding the little orange thing you can see in the uh, guinea corner if you like the, the kind of south uh, eastern corner of of this pie uh, by adding a new biomass to to take up some of the slack now here again there's a negative side with uh, using biomass in the home uh, Girl children and women tend to be the ones who spend most time in the kitchen. Uh, they are exposed to smoke and thereby uh, respiratory disease. This is probably uh, not a good thing in the long term. So we, sh we should try at least in the a few years down the road to shift from firewood to charcoal, uh, which emits uh, less smoke. And then these horrible statistics when it comes to girl children in general. Now, I, I'm mentioning these only to say that I'm concerned that we shouldn't drive this issue of firewood under the table uh, because girl children in Sri Lanka are already disadvantaged, clearly, um, not consciously perhaps, but unconsciously. And since girl children spend a long time in the kitchens, this is a problem that we shouldn't allow to happen. Uh, we shouldn't allow this gender disparity to, to, to go any further down the road. So those are just two ideas that I have for the, the recovery. In the long term, we are going to have a lot of stress. We cannot balance the budget anytime soon. And the kind of reforms we need to do in order to restructure government are really painful for the public to understand. Um, I mentioned a few slides ago that we have this problem with, or maybe I didn't. Uh, what, I, what I intended to do was to, to demonstrate to you uh, that the cost of giving the uh, an egg and 75 grams of fish to every child per year is 50 billion rupees. That sounds like a lot of money. That's about half the education budget. But the fact is that that's about how much Sri Lankan Airlines loses per year. Sri Lankan Airlines loses three million dollars uh, per year. Uh, sorry, per per week. $3 million per week, $150 million every year. And that loss is met by everyone in our country, including the poorest. Isn't it better to look at giving nutrition for our zero to 12 generation, making sure they come out at least with some chance of a future in Sri Lanka, rather than sustaining a luxury airline, which really doesn't do very much. So. We need to do difficult things like looking at privatizing or, or selling or, or, or shutting down things like Sri Lankan Airlines. Many of the other state-owned enterprises, 330 state-owned enterprises making phenomenal losses, 
a lot of other loss making enterprises which really uh, don't even show up in the books like the 28 tourist hotels operated by the armed services for which no accounts are ever produced and cannot even be audited we have no idea how much money they lose and many other institutions like the CEB and the uh, CPET Co, the Petroleum Corporation, are also losing literally billions of dollars, uh, not, not millions of dollars, billions of dollars. So to, to change this around is, is going to be very difficult. If you mention things like privatization, Sri Lankans get very upset. If you try to uh, reverse, for example, the one and a half billion dollars that go out of Sri Lanka every year for educating our youngsters overseas, the, the, the people doing their degrees in the UK, for example, um, to substitute that by having private universities in Sri Lanka uh, to, to accommodate uh, or at least absorb part of that outflow, uh, there's protests. So we have this, on the one hand, we desperately need reforms. On the other hand, we have a public that is predisposed to obstructing or opposing those reforms. Um, and so this tension is likely to slow down the process of rebuilding Sri Lanka. That's why I think it's going to be 20 or 30 years. So that's pretty much what I wanted to put out there and maybe just have a discussion about how we could uh, look at other ideas for how we could go forward or where I might be wrong in, in what I just presented to you. I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert in any of this. I'm, I'm like all of you, I'm sure I'm thinking and I'm trying to influence government policy to, to make the best out of what is a, a plain and simple disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Rohan. It was great that to hear about various aspects that we need to focus. And, and also, it's not the politicians, it's we have to do these things. So um, I'm glad to state that we are also starting similar things. And uh, I just summarize a little bit about the questions that you raised about the stoves. Now, there are very efficient stoves in the market produced locally. And at the moment, we have actually a group who are looking to see how to use local, locally made charcoal. I will let you know in the future how, 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 how that is surfacing. And the, as you said, looking after the younger children is most important. And we, have, we are putting in this food bank um, initiative. There are already people who are interested and then we are planning a subcommittee meeting next weekend. So try to see how to do it. We, we actually don't collect any money. What we are trying to do is put the mechanism in a trustworthy manner and registered as well the recipients so that anybody can directly donate to them. That's how we will work it out, not really involving any middle parties. So, so that is what is going to happen. And we are trying to collect the wasted food in Sri Lanka so that we can use that so that we don't have to import everything. So, and, and so it's working quite well. And I think I was interested in your, in your talk about the fisheries, so we can probably include into that as well. So we are actually looking for mentors. So we need there are lots of expatriate people who are experts in the fields, and I'm glad there are people who are already involved in this, and, and, and they are helping us say, for example, if you get renewable energy, they might ask questions from you. They are already in the in the audience and experts and and they are working as mentors so you can still contribute if, even if you're far away from sri lanka as a mentor so that local people understand the pros and cons about going on these pro, pro programs so so that is what we are doing and um i will uh, let you take there were a few questions sent to you. I don't know whether you had any answers for those. Um, I'll, shall I just dispose of those fairly quickly? Yeah, um, that's a good idea. I've, yeah. I've done the spade work. So one of the questions, I think this is an important question. It's a medical question. So I'm sure you'll have a view on it as well, Shola, is, is um, that whether agrochemicals are implicated in uh, chronic uh, kidney disease in, in Sri Lanka. Um, the thing is, our, our kidney disease profile in the areas in which it does occur is, is very high. I'm just putting there the a graph showing uh, incidence of kidney disease in, in various countries. Uh, the highest is Russia. Uh, the areas that we have bad kidney problems in, like, for example, the North Central province uh, tends to be about uh, 15,000 per 100,000 population. 
whereas in Russia it's uh, 12.8,000. Um, so, and in some areas it goes up to as many as 23,000. If you look at the distribution of kidney disease in Sri Lanka, this is rough, roughly the picture. And why I think agrochemicals are unlikely to be the cause is that the highest areas of agrochemical usage are Norelia and Jaffna, it seems. Um, and we don't have uh, disease uh, appreciably in that northwestern uh, limestone belt or in the whole of the wet zone. So there seems to be some geochemical uh, underpinnings to, to kidney disease rather than just fertilizer alone. The main correlate that has been uh, used to investigate recently has been uh, groundwater fluoride, which is of course uh, nephrotoxic uh, potentially. Um, and the distribution of the high groundwater fluoride region in Sri Lanka pretty much overlaps the kidney, the CKDU uh, region. Now, the thing is, you have to be careful with correlations. They, they don't always imply causation. And so it, it means that we have to look at this fairly carefully. Um, but when we look at the distribution of uh, uh, fluoride uh, in, in serum, for example, we get uh, results that suggest that fluoride possibly plays a part, but groundwater fluoride alone is not enough to explain why CKDU gets started in the first place. So there seem to be other factors as well. Um, so, sorry, so I've, 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 I'm going to fast, I'm going to jump through to some, another slide, here we are. Uh, no, sorry. I might have got confused between. I'm so sorry, I haven't got the, oh, here we are, this one. Yes. So if you look at this slide, at the bottom, you can see kidney function if you use. It's not uh, shared yet. Yeah. The slide. Oh, I beg your pardon. Shared. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why is that not shared? Um, it's showing your desktop now. But that's better. Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm getting there. Now it's good. Yeah, I think. Yeah, let me try and increase that screen size a bit. All right. So here at the bottom, um, uh, you you can see um, the CKD classification of uh, various people against kidney function um, and uh, the uh, as i showed from the previous slide anyway serum fluoride tends to go up as ckd uh, as, as the severity of the disease increases but the problem is that we can't say that that is the cause of high fluoride in serum it, it may be that kidney function going down is allowing fluoride to accumulate in the body. So I, th I think this is a, a question that's been investigated, but apart from the plain agrochemicals label, which and what does that mean? Are you talking about cadmium or arsenic or what aspect of agrochemicals are causing the problem? There doesn't seem to have been uh, any answer. Now, CKDU has been with us for a long time, for maybe three decades. It has been studied in almost 225 uh, scientific studies since 2008. There's, there's about 20 papers coming out every year on CKD, but still no closer to getting to an absolute solution. But I, I think uh, the, the problem is being more under, better understood. But to prohibit agrochemicals on the available evidence seems absolutely premature. The WHO and 50 national experts did a study. Uh, the experts included Dr. Chana Jayasumana, who is the person who implicated glyphosate or suggested that glyphosate might be a cause in 2015. They included him and they didn't uh, make any recommendation uh, as to the agrochemical issue. So that the president felt uh, the need to do this, I think, largely because of pressure from the GMOA in, in Sri Lanka. But as I've shown elsewhere, there's a, I've done a 72 minute uh, YouTube video, which you can watch in Singhala explaining why the GMOA's uh, arguments were completely without uh, foundation. So another question that came in was, uh, 
uh, I don't think it's relevant to what we're doing that organically grown foods have uh, high antioxidant levels. Um, this is not really my thing. The, uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence that, uh, um, or there's no evidence that dietary antioxidants uh, are of any good to you as antioxidants. Uh, obviously, fruit and vegetables contain antioxidants and fruit and veg is good for you, but that's not to say that antioxidants are. So I think this is a, this is another not very meaningful question in, in the way it was, it was formulated. Um, and so I, I put up a slide for, because there was an answer to give. Um, here again, a question as to how we maintain food quality in Sri Lanka. I think for food that we export from Sri Lanka, we pretty much follow the same standards that every other country does. There's nothing really special. So we follow the Codex Alimentarius of the FAO, which is a, like the Bible of residues and so on that you can find in food. The tea industry for its part has a special ISO 3720 that it follows and that's followed rigidly. I used to work in the tea industry, so this is something I'm familiar with. And then we have bilateral agreements with uh, Japan and the EU and so on, on on food residues and standards. And this works pretty well. I, I think I can say with hand on heart that Ceylon tea is uh, the safest tea in the world. I've, I've been involved in that process for many years. Um, and uh, Sri Lankan food generally is, is safe to eat. I, I don't see a problem there. And finally, I think we had a question uh, about uh, why these uh, heavy floods and droughts are taking place. I think this is again a perception because of the human mind focusing on recent events as opposed to past events. When you look at the history of flooding events in Sri Lanka back into the British colonial period, you find that there were really bad floods and droughts even then. And these events are probably becoming more frequent, but they're not becoming more severe. The most severe event, flood event we had was the 1947 flood. Uh, where much of candy went underwater, for example. Um, and also we often neglect that the El Nino, La Nina cycle is uh, sometimes uh, manifests as a 10 or 15 year cycle. And our lifetimes are what, just 60 or 70 years into our adult memory lifetime is 60 or 70 years. So we just go through about four of these cycles in our lifetime. So naturally it looks like there's uh, there's been problems. So if you look at the El Nino, La Nina cyclic periods, so they're at the bottom of the screen here. And then the graphs on, or the maps on top show uh, how excess rainfall during these El Nino and La Nina periods are uh, manifest. And as you can see, the heaviest rainfalls are in areas of the arid zone, um, the, the biggest deviations, the arid zone around Mana and the arid zone around uh, Yala. Uh, so that's why these. When, when, when you get a lot of rain in an you know, area that's usually dry, everyone gets uh, panicked about it. And then the map on the right shows the dry periods, the La Nina periods. So uh, that was all I had by way of uh, answers to the questions. They didn't relate directly to the topic, and so I, I didn't pay much attention to them. So I'll stop the screen share now so that we can go into a, a discussion. Thank you so much, Rohan. There are a few welcome. people who raised the hand, and uh, can I take them as the, they have raised their hands? Uh, particularly, I would like to, uh, the people who are asking questions to just give a small self-introduction so you will know who they are, at least from where they come from. The first, uh, I see a raised hand from Udita. Udita? Yeah, hi, I'm Udita Jayatunga. Uh, medical consultant from Derby. Uh, I think the talk had several uh, areas. The, from the first part of the talk, uh, Rohan was indicating that the problems started or economic problems started in 2019. Uh, I, I thought, uh, from my understanding was that it started at least a decade ago, a decade prior to that around um, from what 2000 and uh, sort of 10 uh, due to excessive borrowing where the government ceiling was 4.5, which was increased to 15% to build all the roads and various other 
things, including many uh, white elephant projects. So, uh, and and I, I believe uh, uh, lots of people knew for a long, long time that uh, we Sri Lanka was heading towards this. Of course, the decisions from 2019 exacerbated the problem. Um, so um, uh, I, I had a, a mortgage shortfall, which uh, and the bank was uh, every year bank was telling me for the la uh, 10 or 15 years that it's going to be uh, I need to do something about it. So as a country, I'm sure that the warning signs would have been known for for a long, long time. Um, so I wonder why Rohan uh, thought that those were not uh, at least partly to be blamed for the current economic uh, uh, crisis, including all the corruption which has happened uh, during that time. Uh, shall I just address that one? I, uh, Udita, thank you. You're, you're quite right. Uh, I should have made that clear. I just thought it was general knowledge. That's why I didn't uh, dwell on the past. I, I think the point at which I uh, started analyzing was the, the point of no return. When, when we started doing things from which would inevitably lead to disaster. Of course, we had unsustainable levels of borrowing uh, from way before 2010. Uh, it was in 2010 that we started borrowing for silly things like like highways that we didn't need and conference centers and you know like wasteful uh, investment so-called investment borrowing for things that didn't pay back um, Mahavali for example we borrowed huge amounts of money but we we paid that back because we got revenue from the hydroelectricity and that was able to fund a lot of uh, social work so I think uh, the borrowing might have been in some sense sustainable until we we refused in 2019 to accept that we need to reform and restructure the economy look at restructuring the debt even at that point so the disaster was avertable until 2019 that's what i meant so but in 2019 we we hold the ship so that uh, with the with the tax breaks and everything that happened after that uh, made the uh, made the economy go into a nosedive especially a COVID didn't help because we lost four and a half billion dollars of uh, foreign exchange from the tourism shortfall as a result of COVID. About a third of our overseas revenues from workers fell. So many factors contributed. I'm, I'm not for a minute saying that the five things that I pointed to were the, for the reasons for the downfall. The downfall was caused by those five things because those five things were policy uh, options that we did wrong at the time. It's just like patient comes into ICU, he's got, a, he's got a history of, I don't know, diabetes or whatever, but he's coming in with a heart attack and you have to treat the heart attack at the time. And what we failed to do in 2019 to now was treat the heart attack. We, so, of course, the underlying diabetes was always there. So that, that, that was why I dealt with the heart attack. Yeah, one of the other things I just want to mention is that uh, Sri Lanka would have been dead and buried uh, probably five years ago if we got the commonwealth games which no one wanted and that was costing more than half the national income i i felt that most of these things was due to executive presidency and no one uh, wanted to argue against the executive president and whatever he thought was uh, his dreams and whatever he thought and whatever his family said was was uh, asked to do rather than any any logical discussion on the uh, the productivity of those things so if sri lanka had got commonwealth games uh, in 2017 we would have been dead and buried by by now um, I, I agree partially with you about the executive presidency there, but remember that mrs bandaranaika did quite well without the executive presidency and she had a similar an unaligned heads of government conference, which cost uh, the budget dearly in 1975 or 76. So um, politicians who, who want to be responsible will be responsible regardless of the limits we put on them. It's very difficult to control that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so two other people have raised hands, uh, Ron. And first is uh, Dharmadasa. Uh, thank you, Chula. Uh, thank you, Rohan, for, for a, a very informative uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned that there are so many organizations in Sri Lanka running with a great loss. Uh, I am an academic uh, who researched on solar energy over four decades and promoted renewables over three decades, especially in Sri Lanka. Uh, I just want to concentrate on CEB, the situation in CEB. CEB runs with billions of rupees uh, loss. Uh, this is due to two main reasons. The first reason is too many employees due to political appointments. Therefore, the organization is very inefficient. The second thing is, uh, there are huge salaries. These salaries were uh, circulated during the last uh, few, few days. Electrical engineer, engineers uh, earn about five to nine lakhs per month. They still demand 300% uh, increase in electricity tariff uh, from consumers to cover those salaries. And also uh, the energy minister presented in the parliament, uh, they have an agreement to increase their salaries by 25% every three years. How can it happen in this situation in Sri Lanka? And also one other thing, my own experience, uh, we had an academic consortium last 30 years, we have been promoting solar, uh, wind, and renewables, indigenous energy sources, they were resisting it. They didn't like renewables. They love coal, oil, and gas imported. And this is a real damage. And also uh, last March, the renewable energy minister said uh, they installed uh, 40 megawatt solar roofs in the country. For two years, CEB didn't connect this to the national grid. This is a crime. This is a criminal act. So the only thing we should do is, this organization cannot run like this. It must be, as you very rightly mentioned, it must be privatized. Otherwise, the country cannot afford it. So that, was, that is all I wanted to uh, mention. I just, it is my energy area and uh, I am sure there are so many, as you mentioned, there are so many other organizations. Why do we have uh, loss making organizations within the country? If we want to recover, do something about it. Especially in the case of uh, CEB, dismantle the whole thing, restructure it, reduce the staff and make it to a a profitable organization rather than loss-making organization. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. I but I, I think if if I can just respond to that, the, the problem is that uh, we have a government that's very vulnerable now. The government is in trouble. Uh, it's unpopular, and the last thing that the government will want is to have strikes on its hands. Because as you know, when the CB gets annoyed, they cut the power. And that upsets uh, the whole country. It, it, it upsets especially export industries. When a tea factory loses power, it, it messes up production, for example, uh, hugely. And we need that $1.5 billion that we earn, uh, earn from tea annually. So a government that can make these reforms has to be uh, one with a massive mandate. Now, this government has a massive mandate. It's got its two thirds mandate, but it doesn't have political capital to spend because of the problem that the country has got into now. So I don't think these reforms will happen in the lifetime of this government or possibly even the next government. But the, the IMF is insisting that we show how Sri Lanka can be brought back into uh, being solvent. And the, the, the restructuring of the state-owned enterprises will be a big element of that but the subject is politically very sensitive because on the one side, the main opposition now that is emerging in Sri Lanka is the JVP, 
Uh, they are they're likely to be the biggest or the second biggest party at the next election. And they are completely opposed to any kind of uh, divestment or, or even restructuring of uh, state-owned enterprises. So this will, this will be a politically very difficult uh, trick to pull for, for the government. I fully agree that uh, the present government is not that uh, in a strong position, but in the past, when the government was very strong, they didn't uh, head on, uh, you know, uh, took action on this type of thing. So in the past also we saw it. I can remember one power and energy minister said, even the government can't control the mafia within CEB. <laughs> that is not acceptable. Yes, I fully agree. Now it is. But in the future, we need a good government. That is what we people need. And in the future, these things must happen somehow. Otherwise, you can't have these loss-making organizations within the government. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, to, to be fair, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kumaratunga in uh, around 2000 managed to privatize Sri Lanka Telecom. Uh, before that, I think President Premadasa managed to privatize distilleries and Lanka milk foods. Um, these worked quite well. They were difficult to do at the time but it shows that it can be done. Shantika Kumaratunga also tried to privatize Colombo Port, but that backfired because there's, I think the Supreme Court went against her on, on, on that issue. If you think about even uh, modern Britain, if not for Mrs. Thatcher's privatizing of uh, steel, coal, and railways in the 1980s, uh, England, the Britain would have been a very different country now, uh, far less prosperous than it is. So, so I think to, to, to have these restructurings is important, but you need to get the people behind you. And at the moment, I don't think the Sri Lankan people will back anything from the government, however good it is. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, <clears throat> I think the three people raised hands of them. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, uh, take Nilmin next because she's posted two questions on the, on the, on the message a long time ago. Is Nilmini there? Can you can you talk? Hi, hi, Chula. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the two questions I posted up on the chat. Um, first of all, just following on from Mr. Darandas's comment about renewable energy. Um, I mean, we're, we're surrounded by oceans. We've got major rivers, waterfalls for hydropower. We've, we're near the equator for solar power, and I'm sure we can rely on wind power. So why is there even consideration of um, turning to things like wood burning stoves or coal? I don't understand where the resistance is coming from um, against this renewable energies. Uh, you meant, Somebody mentioned CEB. I don't really know the full background of um, Sri Lankan politics, I don't really know what, why that is, but surely um, the way to go must be um, these renewable energy sources. Um, yeah, sure, if I could quickly address that. Um, that sure, that the CEB has not put as much emphasis on renewables as they, as they might have. Uh, having said that, uh, renewables also require uh, storage. Now, while renewables are probably very good for getting 20% of our power requirement. We are, we are still not even at 3%. Um, they, they aren't much good beyond that because storing electricity is really expensive. Uh, we've reached about the limit of our hydropower resource now. We, we have about 40% of capacity. If, it's a, if, it, if the rains come on time, about 40% of our requirements can be raised uh, from hydropower, um, which is fantastic. and. Uh, Came, comes largely from the Mahavali projects of uh, the 1980s. But I, I think the, the problem with renewables now look going to the future is that they're very intensive in terms of foreign exchange because we don't make solar panels in Sri Lanka, neither do we make uh, the large turbines that drive uh, wind energy. So this is going to be really expensive. The government recently signed up a deal with the Adani Corporation of India for a large wind power uh, facility in the north the west of Sri Lanka. But this again uh, is looking at generating electricity and in, in Sri Lanka and repatriating the profits in dollars to India. So it's not much better than uh, importing oil as far as the economy is concerned. So this this is a it's a complicated 
area. It's, it's complicated on many fronts. Storage is perhaps the biggest one. Um, and also the capital intensiveness of renewables in terms of foreign currency. I see. I, I can understand there must be a lot of complexities behind all of this. Um, have you seen the WF video on, on solar powered um, stoves? No. Um, may I just take up just 30 seconds to share that on screen? Yeah, or just a second. I, uh, I had to make you. I had to make you a co-host to do that. Just a minute. Uh, um, just a second. I need to find you. Okay, you should be able to share it now. Okay, have a go. Um, Can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. We can see it. Okay, let me just... Um, uh, I don't know to what extent the Sri Lankan government could be persuaded to use this. Um, it's, uh, I, I think the technology is fairly straightforward and uh, there's no reason why people shouldn't adopt it. Uh, the, the market could take care of it. I'm not sure that the government is that necessary. Right. Um, and sorry, the, the second question I had was in relation to farmers, whether the government's giving support to farmers to go back to the fields um, and what access they have to the fertilizer mm -hmm. and pesticides and things that they need, um, rather than relying on, on um, imports of rice, given that rice is a staple diet, um, so that we can go towards um, self-sufficiency again. Um, is there a move from the government to support the farmers on that? Um, there's, there's talk from the government in that direction. The, the problem is that when the fertilizer ban came in in May of last year, a lot of farmers found they couldn't cultivate it. The costs were too much and they gave up farming. Uh, we need to incentivize those people to return to their fields now. This is difficult to do because in the meantime, um, because of global conditions, the price of uh, fuel going up especially, the cost of fertilizer has doubled in, in this last year. So now farmers find it additionally burdensome to, to cultivate with fertilizer and there's less fertilizer going around because there's no foreign exchange to import it. So I think we are looking at another failed harvest uh, this year. The Indians have given us $55 million for fertilizer, which is about, I think, 5% of what we need uh, for a year. It's not going to make that much of a difference. But fertilizer imports are greatly handicapped. Remember that at a time we've got no money for importing petrol and diesel and gas and is running the pipelines for electricity. It's very difficult to get uh, money for this. Is there anything the the Sri Lankan diaspora can do from uh, how a little? Um, is there something that we can do from the UK or USA, Australia, by by 
I don't know, coordinating our efforts perhaps to send the funds or I don't know how to get these things across to the people there. I think the amounts are too big. We'll need about $600 million this year uh, for fertilizer. This is a, a huge amount of money. Um, and so I don't think, I mean, the diaspora could do something, but it, it's better to divert your attention to, to looking after people who are really at risk uh, from especially because of the shortage of medicines. So I, I'm not sure that um, fertilizer is, is the most practical way to spend uh, aid raised by the diaspora. I, I would be more inclined to think that the need for even basic medicines, for example, the children's hospital and the, the cancer hospital would be a better way to, to invest that kind of effort. Okay. I, I think there is quite a lot of effort on, on the medicines and things. Thank you so much, Rahan. Thank you for a very informative talk. Chula, Thank you. Chula could I make a comment on this uh, Nilmini's first question, please? Uh, Rohan, yeah, okay, very short, yeah. Because yeah, there are three Rohan people. Rohan mentioned that uh, the, the energy storage is a problem. Uh, we, are, we are really lucky in Sri Lanka. We have 40% hydroelectricity. If we have 1 million solar roofs, say 5 kilowatts, that is 5 gigawatts. That is during daytime. We can use solar energy. We can save water uh, to, to use in the nighttime. So uh, balancing this is a, a indirect uh, energy storage. In fact, what is happening is uh, to, to remove the intermittence of solar and wind, in the future, this energy will be used to produce clean hydrogen by splitting water. So that is the energy storage. So we should not stop renewables. We should accelerate it. The main reason for CEB not supporting renewables is there is no commission from renewables. When you import fossil fuel, there is a commission and there are people, we have to speak the truth here. So why, why they are glued to fossil fuel, imported fossil fuel? Because they have a good commission there. That is the main reason. Thank you. Okay, uh, just to make an answer, if you have good ideas, please uh, write to us as well because we are practically taking it up as we go to try to implement as much as possible. So, so we are open to any kind of proposal that is practically possible. And then I'll, can I ask Sanjeeva to talk next because uh, he's been waiting for a while, yeah. Sanjeeva? Hi, yeah. Hi, Chula. Hi, Rohan. Thank uh, you. I'm joining from Colombo and I'm in my banyan, so I'm not having my video on. Uh, Ron, uh, one of the things that, I mean, we all agree is that we need to raise more revenue. The government has to, and the budget deficit is far too great to be sustainable. And the debate we have always had is that 80% of taxation is through indirect and 20% is only through direct. Now, direct technically is through both corporation tax as well as individual. Now, I mean, I, I worked in the private sector for more than... 25 years. And the percentage of people who pay income tax in Sri Lanka is, I think, even less than 5%. And it's not part of, unfortunately, Sri Lanka's DNA, even for people who should be paying, they are not uh, compliant. What, what are the things that you propose? I mean, obviously, we need to try and get this 80-20 uh, to a more uh, sustainable thing. Uh, you know, what are the uh, areas where you feel that uh, we could do this adjustment? I mean, 5% of the people cannot be expected to uh, keep uh, paying greater amount of taxes. Any suggestions from you, Rohan? Actually, I don't think that's going to work because the vast majority of employees in Sri Lanka are paid by the government. Um, so taxing them is basically, I mean, there's, there was a reason why government stopped taxing government servants. It was just not worth their effort to do that because they were effectively taxing themselves. I still think that everyone should have a tax file, including government servants, because it forces the, the people who aren't altogether honest at least to make a declaration every year for which they can be later held to account. And, and that's that's important because we have to file a, a you know, a, a, <coughs> a sheet showing our assets and liabilities and this is this is important um, but i i think to increase the tax net as the economy shrinks now is going to be very difficult I, this is as as good as impossible there are a few things we can do like uh, start putting vat back on tourism i think in 2019 the government removed vat from the tourism sector and this is 
four and a half billion dollar sector. So the fifteen percent uh, VAT would have been a very useful six hundred billion dollars for the economy, six hundred million dollars for the economy. Um, so uh, we we we've done silly things like that, but I think those could be just reversed. The problem with having excessively high tax, especially on corporates, is that we have to compete with uh, other countries in the region, with Bangladesh especially, who've got a really good tax regime. And more and more, even Sri Lankan companies, when they can, when they get big enough, uh, are migrating to, to Bangladesh for better, better tax uh, facilities. So I, I think we have to remain competitive on the one hand and, and try and generate revenue on the other. I think the, the really important thing that we need to do is to cut this massive spend we're having on, on state-owned enterprises, which is absolutely wasteful. Like I said, I mean, Sri Lankan loses, the airline loses $150 million a year. This is, this is criminal for when you consider that the people who are supporting that subsidy, who are paying for the subsidy, have never even gone near a plane. It's so it's we, we've just got to cut waste like that, and in addition to that, they they have unsupportable loans of almost a billion dollars taken from the state banks on government guarantees, which can't be repaid. So this this kind of this is like criminal conduct. I think that needs to be to be uh, rectified. Yeah, I I mean I totally agree on the uh, SOEs. Uh, I mean, it's, but even within the public sector, I mean, I came across some research for some of the articles that I have done that 320,000 of our public servants, 17% uh, were peons and drivers. And I know those are political <laughs> handouts which were given now. Uh, technically, they should be made redundant and put to better use because, I mean, when I was in the private sector, we found, uh, you know, shortage, a dire shortage of uh, people for manufacturing, service industries, construction, everything. You know, so as to how, who is going to build the cat, I'm not too sure because those uh, people also have unfortunately got used to uh, this type of government jobs uh, which have and which are, have no accountability, perf no performance relations, and things like that. So I I, I, I totally agree with you, but uh, I don't know from where we are going to go from here. Thanks, Ron. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanchim, for that. I think the uh, time is also running out. Uh, let's uh, uh, take uh, Mervin next, please, for your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Rohan, for the very informative overview of the, the reality, how brief it was. Uh, I'm just speaking on the state on enterprises theme and particularly uh, re referring to Sri Lankan airlines. Because within my lifetime, Sri Lanka as a nation had three airlines from starting with Air Ceylon, three, uh, Air Lanka, now Sri Lankan, none of them could succeed. And uh, in relation to that, here in a small country like Singapore has an airline, which I am led to believe was founded by a Sri Lankan Tamil, a Tamil of Sri Lankan origin. And it's one of the leading airlines in the world, most profitable. And then Emirates that started years later with an airplane borrowed from Pakistani airlines is a le world leading airline. So we need to look at the heart of the matter to say, what is ailing Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan's enterprises? So maybe it's a long debate for another time. I want to, to move on to something else to, on account of the, the brevity of time. Yeah, none of the elected governments have been able to build this cat uh, because they are, everybody has to, they have to look at the, the, the next elections, stay popular, giving handouts, and then terrified by the unions because since the independence, we have been banging the drum about, you know, we are a socialist country. Capitalists are the, you know, the scum that we need to get rid of. So it's been drilled into us. And you refer to JVP as well, with all sincerity they have. It's, it's drilled in, you know, but uh, uh, so the, the governments either don't have the ability, honesty, or the guts to take that on. And we can, in, in the light of today, in the suffering today, uh, it's unlikely to happen possibly within the, our lifetime. So this may be a situation where likes offers the diaspora, the community, that sincerely care. We, we are not going to plan, we have no plans to stand for elections, come to power or anything like that. We talk because we care and we see the bigger picture. Uh, perhaps we need to be that force that can speak up very clearly, put this thoughts together, explain it in a language the ordinary people can understand 
show what is right and wrong and let them see uh, what's happening outside and the benefits of what's being suggested, contribute to the short, medium, long-term plan and work with it rather than you know, leaving it for these populist governments who have got, first of all, not the people of caliber, second one, they got their own agendas. So maybe uh, somebody that they can trust, they can, you know, long term, because we, we can be here, governments can come and go. So when I say we, I'm not referring to just a few of us here, but there are lots of very like-minded, capable people who see it and who feel the pain, who could contribute to that debate to educate, uplift the na nation, walk with them, hold hand with them. And maybe if we get the right people in power, work with them to undertake that journey because as long as we uh, choose to remain poor and you know be the the, the heroes of uh, socialism it's not going to get anywhere because be it russia be it china they are socialists by name only when you look at what they really do it's a completely a different story uh, so let our we people wake up and see the truth and make a choice uh, well thank you for raising that that's all i need to say all right can i quickly comment on that um, which is uh, the, the, the point, I, I take the point about Singapore Airlines and Emirates. Uh, it's a very different level of accountability that there are in both those countries for those two airlines. Uh, you can have a successful national airline, but Sri Lanka can't because we don't have the level of accountability that we need. In 2011, uh, some uh, the CEO of Sri Lankan Airlines was caught, not in Sri Lanka, but by the UK Serious Frauds Office of soliciting and obtaining a $19 million bribe from uh, Airbus industry. Uh, the UK Serious Frauds Office, amongst other crimes, uh, sued Airbus and got a settlement, which I think is a world record of $5 billion, B with a B for Bravo, yeah. $5 billion fine against Airbus. Sri Lanka didn't get one penny of that. The CEO is uh, happily living somewhere, in, never been prosecuted. Uh, he, he was, though, despite being caught red-handed, uh, two million of those dollars were found in his wife's bank account. Uh, and the serious frauds office gave all the information to the Sri Lankan government, but no action was taken. So with, with that level of impunity for political people who benefit from political patronage, it's very difficult to run uh, an airline which depends on procurement in the orders of hundreds of millions of dollars. There's just too much temptation for bribes and not no accountability for people, when, even when they get caught red-handed. That's number one. Number two is, this: there is a myth that every country that depends on tourism needs to have a national airline. Mm. But uh, Greece, Brazil, and Crete, neither of them has a national, none of them has a national airline. And Greece, for example, has uh, 15 times as many tourists as Sri Lanka had in its best year without a national airline. So you, you can run effective tourism without a national airline and the losses that that incurs. This is, this is a myth again that is like in the case of the nationalized industries that is widely uh, believed in Sri Lanka, but it's, it's a myth. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rohan, for, for taking that issue as well. And I think two, two more people waiting. Uh, can I ask Lal Samara Sekara, please? Lal? Yes, uh, th thank you very much for letting me uh, uh, make some short comments and I have some questions, if I may. Uh, uh, my, my first uh, yes, com please. comment is that uh, I, I quite agree with some of the uh, speakers that CEB and and uh, Sri Lankan Airlines, uh, I think that it's 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 a uh, it's a tragedy. It, I think uh, the 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 best way is to just privatize and have have very strong regulatory government bodies to regulate it uh, type of thing. So I think it, that that's the solution. And um, also uh, Chula, uh, this group. I'm new to this group. Uh, how, how do you guys? Uh, influence decision makers as a, as a group. Uh, the answer, yeah. What access do you have to the decision maker? That's my question. Yeah. Uh, you are breaking 
breaking up. Oh, anybody else in the group uh, could uh, could answer that question. How do you guys influence decision makers, and do you have access uh, to them uh, in this group? That that's my question. Um, if I can chip in while Shula gets his act together, uh, this is something I try hard to do. Um, yeah, you can make your way to decision makers once uh, once you know the people who will make decisions. But getting through to politicians in Sri Lanka is very difficult. The, the problem with politics in, in the country is there are very low educational level of most politicians. And uh, so making, I mean, there, I have met ministers who have got more than five years experience who cannot read a bar chart when you when you put it in front of them. So it's, it's there's, a, there's a massive problem with uh, the intellectual challenge of getting ideas through to government. And if they are difficult ideas, they, they are really difficult to do. So I, I think uh, getting ideas into the minds of the policy mainstream is best done through the secretaries of ministries and that that has more success and, and this is easier to do than making your way to a politician so to, to get to know secretaries of ministries is probably the most effective way because these people by and large tend to be very good chula are you back uh, th thank you uh, thank you rohan uh, my, my other uh, uh, comment is that uh, mr dharma sen and uh, um, i think nilmini uh, that that's great. I think Nilmini, how, how much does that those uh, solar uh, solar cookers cost in Sri Lanka? I really don't know what the cost is. In fact, I mean, it, this I was just suggesting that it might be worthwhile looking into it because, according to the World Economic Forum video, it is actually quite a cheap. Sort yeah, of I think I think it's a wonderful thing because this is the best time to introduce because. Once people get used to those things, uh, they, they, they will keep using it. Uh, introducing it in production is the most difficult part, Neil Mini. So this would be the best time to introduce uh, introduce it. And Mr. Dharma saying, I, I think it's wonderful what you are doing. Um, uh, I, 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 I would say, why don't you keep promoting uh, uh, solar in Sri Lanka? That's my comment. My last question is maybe uh, to Rohan or anybody else in uh, economics, economic expert, uh, uh, please educate me. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. So uh, my understanding, Rohan, is that uh, uh, the modern uh, monetary theory, uh, it, it's not, I understand it's not ap applicable to balance of payments, foreign exchange. Uh, locally, it, it is applicable. And um, it, it wa, wa, and basically my understanding is that uh, it is a myth that a, a country, sovereign country that produces uh, a sovereign money uh, need not be run like a household. So, and uh, so uh, therefore the local deficits need not be a concern. Uh, the only thing should be con only thing we should be concerned is with the inflation. Make sure that you could have deficits, but make sure you don't run into high inflation. Uh, could you educate me uh, on this? Am I, am I right in understanding that? Um, I, I'm not the best person to comment on this because I'm not a professional economist. But I, my reading of uh, modern monetary theory is that it works very differently in different economies. Uh, in the US, for example, which has its own currency, which is also the global currency, uh, you, you could play around quite a lot and not suffer grievous consequences. In Sri Lanka, you have a much different situation where you are uh, on a daily basis dependent for everything, as we are discovering now, because we don't have them for imported items for which have to be paid for with foreign currency. So the idea that um, there is uh, only a weak link between money supply and inflation, I don't think really applies in the Sri Lankan context. Uh, we've been bitten by that uh, bug already, as you as we can see around us. Um, this, this was a mistake. And uh, the, there was an economist, or there is an economist called uh, Dr. Kenneth De Silva, 
who who propagated this uh, modern monetarist uh, concept in 2019. He's very silent now that it has gone belly up. So I'm, I'm just mentioning it that we have to be very careful when we try new uh, ideas, when we innovate at the expense of countries. It's much better to hasten slowly, the old Latin saying, festina lente. Uh, don't, don't try to do too much too soon, and that's when things go wrong. All the interventions I pointed out, all five of the things that precipitated the crisis in 2019-2020 were as a result of doing things that were untested in other countries. So I, I think we shouldn't think that Sri Lanka is somehow unique. Uh, when we had COVID, people started recommending, even the health minister recommended the Dhammika Pania for COVID treatment. Absolutely silly, because what about every other country that's got this problem? We became the only country in the world to prohibit the burial of Muslims. How come people think that Sri Lanka is so exceptional that we, we can we know things that the rest of the world doesn't know? This this is silly. So I, I, I would go with I would prefer to go with remedies that have worked in other countries uh, rather than trying to uh, invent uh, new ideas in Sri Lanka that could cause a huge amount of harm. Uh, if I could come in briefly, I got a message from Chula saying, continue, please, because he's, uh, he hasn't got a signal, so we will continue. Just to pick up on one comment, uh, I know the Leeds Initiative is already working with Sri Lankan, promoting the, the clay, uh, the, the stove initiative. Now, picking up on Nilmini's comment, um, we could look into what's available, the solar stoves, we can look into it and see make contact with them, get further information to inform, educate our counterparts in Sri Lanka to see if it can be the catalyst to introduce that in Sri Lanka. Okay. In Chula's absence, can I request Dhammika Herat to, to speak after the question? Next, please. Um, I'm Dhammika Herat. I'm from uh, Canada. I'm in Ottawa. I'm an ag economist by trading. Uh, sorry that I am not opening up my video. I'm also this morning here. Yes, um, okay. My question, actually, first first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Petia Goda, your excellent service as a public intellect and the service that you are doing in terms of myth busting. I, I, I really admire what you did with your YouTube video about Pardhania's, uh, uh, this, this, this great myth, and, and, and thank you very much for that. My question is on the on the dietary part that, that you mentioned about the uh, incorporating fish and, and eggs and all sort of things uh, in order to make sure our children uh, will be uh, fed appropriately nutritionally. Uh, when it's come to supply and demand of, of food items, uh, one thing that we usually, uh, uh, not one thing, one of the important thing that people won't pay attention, there is a market behind this. The market is the, the engine that are running or meeting the supply and demand. Uh, now, when it's come to fish, if it is economical to produce and consumers, it is cheaper to buy, why it is not happening? For instance, if you take chicken, like in the 70s and 80s, chicken was very expensive, but chicken gradually came very, very affordable uh, uh, protein in Sri Lanka. Why not the same thing happening for fish? Uh, I know you have a background in fisheries as well. Uh, is it supply side issue, or is it is it is it uh, is it demand where uh, the consumption habit will be very difficult to uh, uh, modify or change among consumers? Where where is the bottleneck? What prevent this thing is not becoming more popular? Thank you. That's. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think at least in there are two problems. I, I don't know how important they are because I haven't right, looked into them in that much depth. Uh, one problem is that we don't stock many reservoirs. The Inland Fisheries Department does the stocking. Uh, we don't stock many reservoirs with, uh, with uh, young fish uh, every year. We stock, as I mentioned, less than 8% of our uh, freshwater area with fish. Uh, that's that's clearly not enough, and we need to expand that. Uh, the, the second reason is that there are environmental objections. Now, I myself, as a person who cares about the environment, don't like the idea of stocking Sri Lankan freshwaters with uh, African fish. Uh, but 
that ship has sailed now it's too late to stop it we've introduced uh, 20 odd species of fish to sri lanka from overseas into our fresh waters and they're here to stay so my argument is that not much more damage can be done by uh, expanding that fishery because we are not going to get rid of the species that we have already introduced so i i think it's just uh, a simple expansion making the resource available and then as you say the market will take care of it because i suspect uh, wherever there are uh, stocking programs on like parakram samudra mineria and so on uh, there's a there are big fisher fishermen or fisheries communities who catch the fish and sell it so a market exists it's just making it more widespread because in the poorer areas of sri lanka people can't afford to buy uh, marine fish and the problems of freezing and so on come into play and i, I think the market for freshwater fish is almost infinite we, we can easily increase it by 10 or 20 times and still have a demand thank you uh, let's go to lal samarasekar please Uh, Rohan, I just want to thank Rohan. It, it, it's an excellent presentation, Rohan. It, it, your, your effort is, uh, is much appreciated. Uh, I have a very quick uh, one other last question, Rohan. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned that there is no correlation between uh, fertilizer use and uh, kidney disease and so forth. But uh, have they found any... Uh, correlations with uh, pesticide, uh, herbicide, those kind of use with cancer and other other non-communicative um, uh, diseases? Um, the short answer is no. Um, the, the thing is, Sri Lanka's uh, register of pesticides under the agriculture department tends to be pretty on the ball. I mean, I'm not saying now, but I'm, historically, I've dealt with these people for a long time. Um, and we have allowed in Sri Lanka only a fairly small subset of all the pesticides that are approved by, for example, the FDA and the, FA, uh, the FAO. Um, the, we, we, we have removed all the ones, for example, that can be attributed to or can be used for self-harm, for suicide. Um, so there are, we use only a small number of the pesticides that are approved by the international communities in, in Sri Lanka. And internationally, <clears throat> considering again that we are a very small part of the world, uh, if you look at the literature, there's very little evidence of direct uh, harm. I read recently the, the case in the United States where somebody was uh, uh, awarded millions of dollars of damages against uh, a, a, a pesticide company, a, a herbicide company. That's for glyphosate. For, for glyphosate. But again, the science there is very weak. I think in a civil jury trial in the US, you probably could get away with a lot that you couldn't get in a criminal case. And even after that, the US didn't change its policy on glyphosate, neither did the EU, where it's a lot more controversial. The EU uh, last December approved glyphosate for another five years. So I, I think uh, we, we need to be careful when we think that's such a dramatic and trenchant problem as kidney disease in Sri Lanka. It is, it is a serious problem. We have maybe 200,000 victims uh, with a, uh, a mortality rate of about 5% of that every year. So it's, it's a really serious, it's a horrible disease that we have in Sri Lanka. So I'm not trivializing the problem. Uh, I think it's a serious uh, just, problem. This is Rohan, just like cancer rates and all those things. Uh, so they asked, isn't there any correlation between um, uh, uh, pesticide use, for example, with those things, or no? No, we haven't found anything like that. Because if, if anything, Sri Lanka's pesticide use is quite low compared, for example, with Australia, which has uh, which has much better kidney outcomes. So I, I think it, there's no correlation like that. I think the, the underlying story for chronic kidney disease in Sri Lanka, the, the CKDU variety, is, is somehow associated with geochemistry but we haven't still found out what it is because it's got such a unique pattern in Sri Lanka. For example, the, the overlap with fluoride uh, in the groundwater. There, there seems to be something going on to do with the soil and we still haven't un understood exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Oh, one, one other thing I should add is pretty much 99% of the people with CKDU 
have, have been consuming uh, groundwater all their lives, well water. The people, for example, in Anuradhapura town who drink surface water from Nuara Weber, which is where the water supply for Anuradhapura comes from, uh, there is no CKDU in the urban population. It's only in the rural population who are consuming water from dug wells. So just uh, but, but Rohan, uh, they yeah. have been there for, for yeah. eons, and so why sudden then? I, I don't know. Maybe it was undiagnosed and maybe the population in that area has increased a lot because of the Mahavali scheme. Now oh. there's a lot more, lot more irrigated land, and therefore much higher population density in those areas now than there was maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lal. I noticed Chula is back on, so I hand over to Chula and Lakshman, over to you for your question. Uh, Mervin, Mervin, can you continue because I am on the mobile phone? Okay. So oh. somehow the internet continued. So thanks for taking over. Thank you. No, no worries. Yeah. Uh, Lakshman. Uh, thank you, Rohan. Uh, good to see you again after a long time. Uh, also, congratulations from us on uh, winning the prestigious award, the Linear Medal Award this year. Thank you for your hard work and dedicated research. I have just a few points. One first one is uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, Sri Lankan Airlines uh, issue. <clears throat> Why only the Sri Lankan Airlines is uh, <clears throat> making huge losses of uh, billions of dollars compared to other airlines? I mean, we also buy plane tickets. We pay the price. Which are, prices are comparable with other, other airlines. So what is unique in this case? That is number one. Uh, <clears throat> number two, uh, when it comes to the CEB, uh, we have a huge problem as uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Dharme. The CEB also, we pay the normal prices when we buy the gas at the gas stations. So why it's incurring huge losses? It's due to the, the political, you know, messing up with, uh, <coughs> with uh, employing people or something, something uh, basically uh, uh, wrong. <coughs> because uh, the, the consumer pay the, 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 their due prices in, in both these cases. Uh, then uh, the last one, uh, probably uh, I think uh, maybe you can take up these two issues first. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so uh... Dealing with Sri Lankan first, I think part of the reason is because we don't operate these as uh, professional businesses, uh, purely because they're government owned, that the government appoints, for example, the chairman of the airline. We've had chairmen who haven't passed their A-levels, uh, for example, chairman who haven't passed. And uh, so the, again, there is a intellectual under-resourcing of airlines. One would think that you would have a chairman as an airline of an airline being uh, an experienced uh, professional manager with uh, industry experience, but we we haven't uh, we have rarely had such uh, things in Sri Lanka. The second thing is that the government uh, interferes in procurement. Um, there, there's too much money. Uh, an airplane these days costs about 180, 200 million dollars. Uh, even one percent of that is a substantial amount of money. Sri Lanka recently advertised saying that they want to buy uh, or lease. 19 new Airbus aircraft. You can just imagine how much that is a two and a half billion dollar deal. So there's a lot of money at play here. And in a, in a country that is endemically corrupt, you're likely to see uh, a lot of wastage and corruption because of that. The abuse of power also is, is very extreme where the uh, president, for example, in the, in the old days, not the present president, would just take a plane and go off on trips. So this, this kind of mentality breathes itself. Uh, but, but my argument would be that if, they, if it's possible to have a profitable airline for Sri Lanka, then it should be driven by the private sector, not, not by the government. Because the, the, even if you close Sri Lankan airlines today, the government is left, we are left with a bill of more than a billion dollars, again, billion with a B. Uh, to, to settle the outstanding debts that we have undertaken, plus perhaps about a half a billion in outstanding debts for fuel. So massive uh, losses have to be made good by us. And uh, because this, this airline has been kept going on public money for a very long time. Uh, the the yeah, CEB yeah, is... Right. Just a sorry. minute, Rohan. I, I think this is the time with a very weak government, this is the ideal time to, to, to uh, privatize or just uh, abolish the Sri Lankan airlines. 
because there are no, no political uh, influence, I mean, strong <laughs> president, or, uh, this is the best time. Otherwise, we will be uh, continuing to, to, to uh, face these losses more and more, right? Yes, I, I, I agree. In fact, about, about three months ago, I did a short YouTube video of about 10 minutes, I think, on, on this Sri Lankan issue. You can find it if you search for my name on YouTube um, and uh, explain uh, the, the nature of the problem. And soon after that, the Sri Lankan Airlines uh, unions came out with a statement that uh, if uh, anybody messes with uh, trying to privatize the airline or close it down, they will call a general strike across the country and this kind of thing. So uh, yeah. unions are, are very sensitive yeah. to this yeah. kind of thing. Okay. But okay. I, uh, I I showed in that that if you pay uh, the, the annual loss, the $150 million, if we spend it on the 4,000 Sri Lankan Airlines employees, uh, they, they can go home with basically their salaries for the rest of their lives and it still save us money. Even if golden handshake. Work. Golden, a golden handshake. A very golden platinum handshake. Yeah. Uh, the other issue of the CEB, I think we have to also look at it as a balance because the government has always been interfering with the, the prices of electricity, uh, which which make it very difficult for them to, to manage because uh, we sell electricity at a hugely subsidized price. Many Maybe people don't pay yeah. their bills. Um, and uh, so the price we are paying for 100% electrification, because now pretty much 100% of the country, every household is connected to the grid, means that we give most households, the vast majority, very, very cheap electricity, way below cost. And then the people who are better off, like myself, for example, are on solar, and we are off the grid, so we are not really contributing very much to the uh, CEB's revenues. So the CEB naturally makes uh, massive losses. So I think... Uh, People on solar have been part of the problem, myself included, to be honest, yep. um, because the, to give the poor uh, a reasonable amount of uh, electricity cheap has been uh, a fantastic thing. It's good to see children studying by the light of an electric lamp rather than by a, a kerosene lamp, which was burning children very often. Uh, but at the same time, it's an unsustainable business model. So this needs to be restructured from the ground up, as we talked about a minute ago. Granted, granted, the only problem of these subsidy uh, schemes are that everybody enjoys the subsidy, including the super rich. Yeah, including myself. It's 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 wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just adding to that, I understand if it perhaps uh, Rohan, you could correct uh, me that uh, as part of the the, uh, the the perks, the politicians get free electricity. Oh, no, 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 you don't. Right. I'm being thing. corrected on that. Yeah. Some of them don't pay their bills. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's, Quite a big that's bills. different. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Um, right. So Chula's line isn't reliable. So as such, he said that we continue. Now looking at it, nobody else is putting the hands up, and uh, we uh, have been talking for two hours. So unless there's anybody else, I'm happy to bring this meeting to a close by thanking Dr. Rohan Petiago very much for the very impressive presentation and all the, the discussions that followed. Thank you also for everybody for your attendance and contributing to this uh, very fruitful session. Thank you. Uh, good night. One, one, quick, one, yes, one quick correction before saying good night is that I'm I'm Mr. I'm just playing Rohan Petyagoda, not Dr. Rohan Petyagoda. Right. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Rohan Petyagoda. Good night, Sri Lanka. Good evening, UK. And good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.